Unexpected circumstances led him to an unexpected career. Becoming a goldsmith, that was by chance and by accident. His pieces have dazzled clients all over the world for years, but now this master craftsman is focused on helping Africans benefit from their continent's precious resources. I have a passion. I don't know how to describe it. I just felt that what I've learned and been taught over the years and what I've come to know is pointless having all this information in your head. I need to transfer it to the next generation. This week on African Voices, meet the goldsmith trying to help Africa shine. Nigerian jeweler, CEO and teacher, Lavi Kapo. There's something very different, very special. Here we are, I'm working with the most expensive materials on the, probably on the planet. It has a different feeling. There is also a risk because um, as you're manufacturing, you can chip and break. Fortunately, with gold, you can melt down and you can start again. Lavi Capo has never been afraid of taking risks. That attitude has led him to a successful career in a field not typical for people with his background. He's the first black member of the executive board of the Jewelry Manufacturer Association. That's a wing of the Jewelry Council in South Africa. And he's made customized handcrafted jewelry for some of the top auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's. Our lubricant is beeswax. It is the best lubricant rather than oil. So while it's still warm, I sometimes rub this on. From his workshop in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg, South Africa, he caters to elite clientele who pay tens of thousands of dollars for some of his pieces. And what, what we're actually doing, we're actually making it thinner and thinner as we go through, as you see the holes graduate downwards, and then we're actually making it thinner till we get to our required thickness that we're making there. And that British accent, it comes from his years growing up in London, but his story starts in Africa. Most people know me as Labby, Labby Capo, but um, my full name is Thomas Owo Labby Capo, or Akapo. My father removed the A when we, he travelled to Europe. Akapo, it's um, from the Yoruba clan in Nigeria. It literally means treasurer, treasurer, as in, in the days when we had our own government. That's what our family represented. Originally, I'm from Nigeria. I was born in Lagos. My parents, in those days, for further studies, they travelled to Geneva. And um, I understand from my mother, I had my first birthday when I was on the boat going over to Geneva. From Geneva, they finished their studies, and then we moved to London, and that's where I grew up and was educated. When I was at school, I was um, very good at what we called workshops in those days, um, where, fortunately, I went to a school which had... A, had a very fully equipped workshop. We had laves as well as welding benches, as well as all different types of things. It was like a mini factory, and I was able to ex excel in, in, my ha in the hand skills and win awards when I was at school. The jury aspect came because when I was growing up in London, I, I think I was about 10 years old, and by sheer chance, the Tutankhamun exhibition came to London, and um, it was all over the newspapers and on the television. So I was just looking at the jury aspect in those days. And um, at the moment, I didn't have that desire to go that direction yet. But I always remember that exhibition when it came to London. Becoming a goldsmith, that was by chance and by accident. Originally, when I left school, I was doing sheet metal work and um, mechanical engineering. And by, at that time, a friend of mine, Bernie, Bernie Bologna, um, he was working in a jewelry shop. And um, I saw a watch in there I liked, and I couldn't afford it outright. So I asked him, look, could you have a word with your employer? Could I pay in installments because I really like the watch? And he said, yeah. He then spoke to his employer and uh, made the arrangements that I could pay in installments. Um, the strange thing out of it is, is that um, at the time I'm making my last payment, he was no longer there in their employment. So they, when I went there to make my last payment, Mr. and Mrs. Pira, they said, look, Bernie's moved on. Um, thank you for buying the watch, etc." And uh, 
would I like to do some work for a couple of weeks just to help them out until they could find someone to, um, to take Bernie's post. So I accepted that post and, I, and that's how I started 38 years ago in 1976. Going back to the 70s now in, in London, um, there wasn't too many black goldsmiths around that I even knew of in those days. Um, I saw it as a craft and as a trade and I enjoyed it. I liked what I saw and I liked what I could learn and what I could do within the industry. So that's what inspired me and kept me going. Despite being a minority in the field, Capo was able to find work at a number of London's fine jewellery shops where he gained valuable experience. I was fortunate to meet some of the elders who were very experienced. One company I did, I did work at was um, Andrew Grimmer. He was um, the Queen of England's court jeweller, the Queen's court jeweller, and um, it's quite a prestigious post. Well, basically, it means that if the Queen buys from you, the Queen of England buys from your establishment for more than five years, you're entitled to put a crest up to uh, let the world know that the Queen does buy from you. What's unique about the snap is that you actually push this piece down here and you withdraw the piece so you're able to then put the necklace around your neck, bring this back through here and then there's the snap. Now you can see if you have a closer look here, you can see that it's all set for diamonds to go around the outskirts of it. Um, obviously the side has to be decorated, we don't just do a plain side, everything is decorated. After years of learning from his mentors, Capo began freelancing and creating his own pieces. I started doing commissions for some of the big um, auction houses. Uh, a colleague of who I worked with very closely, he had a flair for design and um, um, had some ideas of with a lot of the pearls and diamonds and earrings and etc. And I started to make these pieces up for him, and he was then submitting them into um, in those days the auction houses was Christie's, Sotheby's, and Phillips. So that's when I started to see my work appear all around the world. Obviously, I felt elated and quite um, happy just that my work was going along in that direction. But at the same time, you're working for someone else. You're not really running your own business. So you're, I was happy, obviously, but I have the edge to want to run our own company as well at one time. I was registered at the London Assay Office. I'd, I've had my own hallmark since 1980. I, um, later on in the 90s, I became a member of the Master Craftsman, and that's not an easy thing to become a member of because really two highly or recommended goldsmiths have to recommend you and then you're, you can, they come to you and ask if you'd like to join. So I was in these sort of um, clubs and fraternities within London but still I wanted to go the extra step of running our own business. I saw it was very expensive for me to take that extra leap and um, our industry as you know it is expensive and investments is all part of the game in, in the jewellery industry. And um, I wasn't having much joy with investors within London or, or people who would like to take on the type of jewellery that I was doing. And it was at the very high end, so a lot of money is, is required. So I then started looking at um, coming back to Africa. But Capo's return to the continent of his birth would be a risk and far from glamorous. No running water, no electricity, but... Uh, well, I gained a lot of knowledge and experience.
I wouldn't be able to give you design because literally I'm in that position where you just give me a stone and with that stone I know how I'm going to make it from the stone. I don't literally have to, always have to have a piece of paper design because I would have done it over the years and many times. Nigerian jeweller Labi Capo was raised in London and spent years perfecting his craft there. But when he wanted to open his own store, he looked to Africa. And the idea may have been sparked by a chant history lesson. I was fortunate enough back in 1985 to go to an exhibition and um, I was able to see jewellery that had been manufactured here in Africa going back 4,500 years. And all this jewellery was on show in Brussels. And um, the strange thing is, is there was only three black people who at the exhibition. I was one of them, and the other two were friends of mine who had come from London. So I was just amazed at just the quality of the jewellery that had been manufactured and um, just the standard. Just There were so many things. The fact that I'm seeing gold, that means there was already mines going on. The mining was taking place. So... You have to go back at least four or five thousand years to see, to see that this is what was going on in Africa. I eventually, I started making my way back. I did journeys here and there, and um, I had a look at the industry at different parts. But um, I did quite a few trips to Africa in different, part, different parts, from Ghana to Sierra Leone to Nigeria. Um, and then I decided, to, uh, you know, to probably look about starting a business in Africa. Eventually, um, I had an opportunity to come back to Ghana, where I went into the interior with some friends and to do some prospecting or gold mining. And, uh, I, well, that, that was very enlightening and, and experience. And fortunately, I was able to bring my wife with me. And at that time, our two-year-old daughter, our daughter, who was then two, we came to live us in the rural area, and in total, we spent between three, nearly six months living in, in the interior. No running water, no electricity, but uh, well, I gained a lot of knowledge and experience, especially in the weights and measures within uh, the Ghana industry. This is a piece that I've made in 18 karat and silver. I specialize also in antiques. Um, Back in the 1800s in, in Europe, they would have used the silver to reflect the white diamonds, and they would have used the uh, um, 18 karat yellow to reflect the blue, the sapphire, or the emerald. Now, underneath, at the back, it's all 18 karat yellow gold, and obviously, you don't just have a one straight hole, you decorate the back of all the jewelry as what is required for the international standards. Now these pieces here, there's engineering involved here because this piece comes out, which sets a different stone. This piece also comes out, so that you can have you can actually have a different contrast of the jewelry, and that's how it. So that's what it would look like without the stone. And then you can see you can now set your blue or yellow stones in here. The experience Capo gained in Ghana gave him a new appreciation for his continent's valuable resources. That is the whole point of my presence here in Africa because um, I was aware of these raw materials from as far back as Ghana. I traveled to places in Nigeria. I saw that in Nigeria that we had um, sapphire, ruby, emerald. We had all the semi-precious stones are there as well. Ghana that was known for gold. Nigeria has gold as well. Um, Sierra Leone I've traveled to is known for its diamonds. So the raw materials are here. Africa has been blessed, truly blessed, with abundance of all the raw materials in which to thrive for the jewelry industry. Capo accomplished his goal of ownership in 2002 when he opened Akapo Jewels in Hyde Park, a wealthy suburb of Johannesburg. I specialize in high-end jewellery manufacturer because that's what I was accustomed to in London because I had got to quite a high level in London and making one-off or bespoke handmade pieces of jewellery. And I, that's the bit that I enjoy because nothing's identical, nothing's the same and every stone's different to the next stone. And um, I felt that um, my skill would be... Re uh, how can I say, it won't be needed here, but my skill could be enjoyed here. Capo believes in economic beneficiation for Africa. And that means the value derived from asset exploitation should benefit local communities. 
beneficiation benefits the community, literally, because once, um, the, obviously, beneficiation works if the government it believes wholeheartedly, and that's what the South African government are doing right now. They are benefi- beneficiating their raw materials, and so it's required to transfer the skills to the next generation so that they will benefit. Um, exporting a, lo- a bar of gold... It, it, may bring some income to the, to the economy, but a finished product will bring a great income into the economy, and it will provide a skill for the young people and bring down unemployment, and everybody likes that. To do his part in transferring skills to the next generation, Capo is sharing the knowledge he's gained and hoping some of Africa's youth can gain the same appreciation he now has for the continent's resources. I'm one of those craftsmen who believe that when I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you to be better than me. We want to hear from you. Let us know which African you most admire and why. Go to cnn.com slash African Voices. Scroll down and you'll see the question, which African do you most admire? Just add your choice to the comment thread. I made a butterfly for the Nelson Mandela Foundation in 2010. I made this butterfly all in platinum um, with some highlights of yellow gold pieces on the butterfly. I made what they, we call in Europe a trembler, um, where you would actually make a piece of jewellery, you would then get the gold and alloy it in another way, add in a bit of nickel, the gold becomes very springy and then you can actually make a coil spring and then you can actually make your um, item shake and shiver. Now, it, the, the piece actually went on sale to, um, went on an auction in 2010 where Mr. Tokyo Sequali bought it and the proceeds were all went to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Nigerian jeweler Labi Kapo has been doing business in South Africa for more than 10 years and he does what he can to give back. That's evident in his role as teacher. I have a passion. I don't know how to describe it. I just felt that what I've learned and been taught over the years and what I've come to know is pointless having all this information in your head. I need to transfer it to the next generation. They are the future. So this is what my plan is and I believe I'm going in the right direction. I lecture at the University of Johannesburg. Um, I originally came on board uh, lecturing because um, through beneficiation, which is the B word in South Africa here especially, one of the mining houses, I think it was, I believe it was Anglo Plant, 
who had um, sponsored a workshop in the University of Johannesburg, a platinum workshop. And um, it would laid empty for some time. They hadn't had a specialist as a platinum smith who could um, um, teach the, the students platinum. So I was, someone heard about me, and I was re they came along and interviewed me in my old office and um, asked if I would be interested in doing a two-day course um, teaching young people the uses of platinum. His protégés have won awards, their work has been featured on the front pages of magazines. He's always encouraged his students to outshine their master. We start at 30 and we're slowly come down till we reach our 26th hole. So we're going to stage, that's perfect, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, let me just... I'm one of those craftsmen who believe that when I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you to be better than me. I'm not teaching you to be as good as me. There's no progress. The whole idea is that I'm teaching you to be better than me, and I'm hoping and believe that if I do the right and pass on the right skills, that my students will excel and will be better. And some of the students who I taught back in the University of Johannesburg back in 2008, they're winning awards. I can show you some of their things that they've won, and they've moved on themselves. And so they're, and they're in the industry, which is the most important part. Apart from teaching platinum manufacturing at the University of Johannesburg, he also mentors and trains students at his workshop. Well, I generally teach, well, I believe, towards the higher end of the jewellery industry because that's what really what's required. Um, so you'll see most of what you'll see here, it's um, not just one pe an item, it's made up of three to four, five, six, seven components sometimes. So it's a process, and so you have to... Um, um, require quite a few skills along the way. So we don't just make um, a cluster here like we've made here. We also make the back part and decorate the back. So that's all part of the design of the, the piece that we make. So it's just what we're required, what's the international acceptable standard that we, um, we work to. I'm here every day. I do, unless I do some of the government work, and I do go out on a few occasions, um, I do audits and sometimes I'm, I sit on different panels and I go along different places. But most of the time I'm, I'm here, so I'm seeing the students on a daily basis. And um, that's what we required, because this, this industry is it, a hands-on. The more you do it, the, be the better you get at it. Capo's wife, Woomba, is a partner in the business and sometimes... She's a stand-in model. I just felt one way of decorating our hair. Now, my wife happens to have her hair in locks, and I managed to make some pieces up to, to, to just to go on her hair in different places, just to highlight her hairstyle. So whichever way she ties her hair, you always get some light reflected on some of these gold pieces. And I believe, probably in our ancient past, we would have done it. I don't believe I'm the first. Now, these hair pieces, they're in 22 carats. These are unique, that's a design I just thought of over the years, and um, they just reflect light accordingly, and I, I believe there's special properties, spiritual properties there coming from the sun, and there's some here which are just, as you walk along, the they're, they're shaped. And I do different sh shapes and signs, and there's half a moon here. So I do a whole variation of them, but it really specializes for your hair in locks. So um, we... Um, my wife and I, um, who run this company, we decided to make a, a joint venture with the Bafa King people or the Bakhatla Bakafela community in the northwest. They're a community of, say, about 350,000 people. Um, they're spread over 32 villages, and um, we hope to be their service provider to teach the young people, the manufacturer, enduring platinum. And the, the, the best thing about it is, is that when we manufacture there, the platinum won't go more than two to three kilometers from the area because it will come from the ground. We will manufacture it into the high-end jewelry. And um, we're obviously, we'll, I'll be making pieces anyway, but I'll be teaching the young people because they're eventually going to take over from me anyway. As for his future, Capo wants to do more teaching and training, but he has no plans to stop creating masterpieces anytime soon. Well, how can I say? Africa is different. I know what I'm accustomed to making in Europe. Here in Africa, we're seeing things differently. You're seeing different plants, different insects. 
you're seeing many different things that we weren't, I wasn't familiar with. So it's a new inspiration. You can re-inspire the game.